We're pleased now to turn to the Speaker of the House from 1995 to 1999, Newt Gingrich, a man who has one of the most extraordinary intellects of any public figure in memory, certainly since Winston Churchill left the scene. He is a man who has published, imagine this, 19 books, 10 of them New York Times bestsellers, he hangs his hat at least some of the time at the uh, American Enterprise Institute in Washington, uh, also spends a fair amount of time commentating and providing analysis of the news and political developments for Fox News. He was uh, memorably Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1995, and he's been uh, the Man of the Year more often than not for many of us ever since. Newt Gingrich, welcome to Secure Freedom Radio. It's a great privilege to have you with us. Well, it's great to be with you, and this is a very important concept, and I'm delighted that you're taking the lead in helping alert Americans to what we need to do to secure freedom. Thank you. Well, uh, your contributions in this regard are, are deeply appreciated, and I hope you will continue to uh, f- make use of this uh, this vehicle for doing so. Let's first off start with uh, developments in Iran. There's a lot I want to cover with you, and I hope we'll be able to move through it swiftly. But you've given thought, I know, to the peculiar situation the United States finds itself in at the moment, uh, Mr. Speaker, when we are essentially sitting on the sidelines, um, seemingly indifferent to the efforts of people who aspire to freedom in Iran. Tell us what you would tell President Obama he should be doing, and and more to the point, what should we be doing as Americans at this moment? Well, you know, Quest and I made a movie called Ronald Reagan Rendezvous with Destiny, in which we show uh, pretty clearly how President Reagan designed a strategy that unlocked the entire Soviet empire. And the key to that strategy was to have a combined process of psychological, political, economic, diplomatic uh, pressure. He didn't use military force except in very limited ways. Uh, And, in fact, in Eastern Europe, he didn't use military force at all in places like Poland, Hungary, Lithuania, Latvia, Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, East Germany. Uh, But he relied on the desire of people to be free. And I start with the notion that uh, clearly a vast number of people in Iran do not like the current dictatorship and that the United States should develop a strategy for reaching out to those people, encouraging them, and it should adopt a strategy to undermine and weaken the current dictatorship. Uh, I, I don't see any way in the long run to accommodate this dictatorship. It's very much like North Korea in that it is governed by principles and patterns that are beyond normal traditional negotiation. Uh, And I think that we have to have a strategy to get to a post-dictatorship Iran if we're ever going to have safety in the region. I couldn't agree with you more, and I'm so heartened to hear you say that. Um, And needless to say, having had the privilege of working for President Reagan during part of that time when he was not only articulating but executing the strategy for, as you say, unlocking the Soviet Union, and I see euphemism, I think, for destroying the Soviet Union, it it would be so important at this moment, it seems to me, for a similar kind of strategic thought and, and practice to be applied, and not just in Iran, but um, here we have a, a, the spectacle closer to home of, of uh, people who actually have enjoyed freedom in Honduras, now seeking to ensure that it isn't... Uh, taken away from them by uh, a man who clearly is in the mold of uh, of those in Iran, those in neighboring uh, uh, Venezuela, uh, who are seeking to use the patina of elections to establish in what amounts to dictatorships. W- what would your view on the Honduran situation be? Well, I've said uh, consistently that the experts I talk with on Honduras uh, feel very deeply that uh, this is a situation where the rule of law uh, clearly is on the side of those who stopped a man from becoming a dictator. And when you look at the the habits, uh, the traditions in Venezuela or in in, uh, Cuba, uh, there's a very real threat in the Latin American tradition of seeing popular government degenerate into dictatorship and then the dictatorship eliminating all opposition, as uh, Chavez is doing in Venezuela right now, Uh, and as Castro has done since 1959 for 50 years. Uh, they've run a police state in Cuba. 
Uh, and I think that it is, uh, again, when you talk to people, Congresswoman Ileana ross Leighton, who is an expert in the area and is the uh, ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, when you look uh, at what she has said as an expert in the region, uh, when you look at uh, what uh, former Assistant Secretary Roger Noriega has said about what's going on down there or what uh, Ambassador John Bolton has written, it's clear that the rule of law is on the side of those who want to preserve freedom and that the right. – deposed president was, in fact, uh, attempting to become a dictator and would have succeeded in creating a dictatorship uh, had the Supreme Court and the military and the Congress not acted. And this is what uh, people in the Obama administration don't seem to understand. This was not a military coup. This was a directed action by the Supreme Court in defense of the Constitution, reinforced and supported by the Congress, including by the members of uh, the incumbent president's own party who had seen him uh, as, as a dictator. And I've analogized it to Richard Nixon and Watergate and said, you know, what if people around the world had said at the point where Nixon resigned, no, no, you're not allowed to ask him to resign. We insist he serve the rest of his term. Um, yes, we'll, we'll you know, it would have been a violation him. of our rule of law. Yeah, I'm sure we would have considered it meddling in our internal affairs. Um, uh, did you happen to see uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, essay by uh, Daniel Henniger, its uh, deputy managing editors, yesterday, uh, Mr. Speaker? No, I did not. It, it was it was about. It, it, well, I'd commend it to you if you haven't, and, uh, and to the Secure Freedom Radio listening audience uh, with whom uh, you're now engaging, the uh, former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. I, I mention it because what he basically laid out was an argument that you have a a very ominous development here where our own president is uneasy about standing up for our form of democracy and seemingly increasingly willing to accept what is being portrayed as democracy at the hands of Vladimir Putin, for example, or Hugo Chavez, or others of their ilk, uh, Ahmadinejad and the mullahs. Um, giving rise to a situation, he argues, Daniel Henniger in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, giving rise to a situation in which we might well find ourselves, allowing true democracies to be snuffed by these Potemkin democracies and, uh, and those who really seek cynically to exploit them simply as a means of gaining permanent power. Well, as you this remember, is something that I'm sure uh, you've given the, thought about. In... I say one of the hallmarks of Jimmy Carter was a uh, an absolute propensity to undermine and weaken America's allies while apologizing for and being supportive of America's enemies. And uh, it was a, a four years of weakness that culminated in the Iranian hostage crisis. Uh, and, and you see some of the similar patterns right now uh, in a way that makes no sense. I mean, it's very hard to understand. Uh, why uh, this administration, you know, here's a president who uh, prides himself on being eloquent, uh, prides himself on being a great public speaker, yet he can't find it in himself to say anything in favor of the people in Iran who are risking their lives in order to stand up for honest elections and for the right of the opposition party to win an election. Uh, somehow he then becomes mute. Uh, in the case of he's a lawyer, and, and you'd think as a lawyer he'd understand the rule of law, yet in the case of Honduras, uh, he can't understand the difference between a would-be dictator uh, and uh, the rule of law. In um, Venezuela, you'll remember at the OAS meeting, he embraced Chavez, who promptly gave him an anti-American book, which was, uh, I think, a deliberate act of contempt uh, for the what they see as the weakness of this administration. The North Koreans cheerfully fire off missiles on our 4th of July, having earlier deliberately fired off a missile on the morning that uh, Obama was going to um, make uh, Cut a uh, speech about nuclear <laughs> arms. I mean, you wonder yep. how often uh, you have uh, the kind of pressure uh, from these folks that we're that we're talking about, we're, we're, the president just seems to not understand about the real world. Well, this is a point we're going to pause for a moment here, Mr. Speaker. Um, but as a historian, which you were before coming to uh, office and have been again since, I really think it's so important to to do what you touched on a moment ago to not only talk about sort of our experience with the Carter administration, but really the experience throughout history 
of American and other leaders appeasing um, their enemies and uh, undermining their friends. And when we come back, we will get into this and a great deal more with the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Newt Gingrich, here on Secure Freedom Radio with Frank Gaffney. Stay tuned. You're listening to Secure Freedom Radio with Frank Gaffney. And welcome back. We have a very special interview on Secure Freedom Radio today. Uh, We're talking with the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Newt Gingrich, a man who has practiced national security policy at the highest levels as well as studied it more intensively and written more thoughtfully about it than, uh, than just about anybody I know. And as a result, we're thrilled to be able to drill down a little bit further on the conversation we were having with you, Mr. Speaker, before the break. In terms of this practice of rewarding bad behavior on the part of America's enemies, um, encouraging, by so doing, more bad behavior, of course, but also in the process raising questions in the minds of our friends as to whether we will be reliable in their defense, uh, whether we will be a a partner with them in freedom. And that can only mean we have fewer friends in the future. This would seem to me to be an historical lesson. Would you agree? And, And is it something that we should be calculating upon as we try to address what Barack Obama is doing today? Well, I think that uh, there's a huge danger because You know, people are naturally, legitimately insecure, and people uh, are consistently worried about uh, what do they do in a dangerous world. And if we're in a situation where people are believe the United States is unreliable, that it's weak, that it's uncertain, this is why uh, Carter's handling, for example, of the Shah of Iran was so devastating, because coming shortly after our abandonment of South Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, it really convinced people that we were an unreliable ally, and it took a substantial amount of effort, as you'll remember, by Ronald Reagan in the uh, first year of his presidency to begin to rebuild a sense that the United States was a serious country. Um, yes. And, and I think that's, that, that we have to recognize uh, the president has not yet done a radical damage. Uh, all we're seeing right now are symptoms. But we certainly look on, on the case, for example, of North Korea, where the president said in his speech in Europe – on the day that the North Koreans deliberately fired a missile several hours before his speech on nuclear disarmament, he said at the time there will have to be clear steps taken uh, given this violation. Well, nothing was done. Uh, It was a joke. And then uh, since then they fired uh, seven missiles uh, during the Fourth of July weekend. Uh, Nothing was done. It's all a joke. And I think uh, what you have to worry about is at what point do – Predators begin to believe that the, wor- that, it, that the world has become dangerous for democracy and safe for predators, and then things get yeah. very dangerous. Well, and I, I would just perhaps uh, suggest that we may find that more radical damage has been done than we really appreciate just yet. It, it just hasn't become obvious, and certainly the, the takeaway from the predators, as you put it, uh, has not yet begun to translate into action. So this is a this is a trajectory we're on, and I think it's so important. And I appreciate so much your insights in this uh, historical as well as uh, uh, you know prognosticating assessment of it. Can I turn to uh, an issue that I know you've spent a lot of time on? Uh, we've touched upon it a little bit here too, but um, weapons of mass destruction. You participated in a very interesting and quite comprehensive look at all of this back before 9/11. Uh, with a congressionally chartered commission in 1999. Today we have uh, the president embracing an idea of a nuclear-free world. It turns out, as you know from the New York Times over the weekend, that, uh, that he actually has espoused this back since 1983. Is this a practical idea, and are we likely, by pursuing it, to make the world more dangerous rather than less? Well, you know, let me say, first of all, in all fairness to uh, Senator Obama, uh, Ronald Reagan always wished we could get rid of nuclear weapons. And he always said his goal was to try to get to a a nuclear-free world. Uh, Now, the difference was Reagan wanted to have a very powerful, very robust missile defense system. And Reagan, as a practical matter, was a very tough negotiator and it took no steps that would lead to any kind of unilateral disarmament and, in fact, vigorously and deeply opposed the nuclear freeze movement precisely because it unilaterally disarmed the West. 
so so the sentiment is not by itself irrational. I mean, frankly, I'd like to live on a planet that didn't have nuclear weapons. But the, the challenge is, given the advantage that one, two, or three nuclear weapons would give a dictatorship that decided to break the treaty secretly, going to a genuinely nuclear-free world would be putting at risk every country on the planet against a country which managed to conceal its development. And uh, people can say, well, it's easy to test, it's easy to track down. I would just note for folks that uh, the uh, uh, tests that were done in Pakistan and India came as a great shock. Uh, right. When they occurred, I believe it was in 1999, uh, that there, in fact, uh, routinely uh, challenges to uh, our intelligence capabilities. Um, <clears throat> And I'm always surprised that the very liberals who tell us how much they dislike the CIA promptly turn when it's something they want to do and promise us that the CIA will be perfect in executing their particular fantasy. <laughs> Especially on arms control. Exactly right. Uh, that That is a point I want to come back to in just a moment in light of the present dust-up uh, between uh, Congresswoman Pelosi and other Democrats and, and the CIA. But f just bear with me on this for one more moment. I fear, again, historically speaking, that, that what we have seen in the past is that even if you could achieve a world somehow where there were no nuclear weapons, and I completely agree with you that, that it's probable in the extreme, but even if you could, doesn't that simply clear the way for more of the kind of global, conventional conflagrations that we've experienced uh, too many times in the past with all that that entails? Well, it might. I think the question you have to ask yourself is whether the absence of a general war has been because uh, nuclear weapons existed or whether it's been because the relative balance of power has consistently been on the side of the democracies. Um, and I think you can argue it either way. I, I would simply say that I, my fear is not that a conventional China or a conventional Russia is going to overwhelm a conventional United States if we're prepared to maintain the burden that we've carried now since 1939. But I think if we allow ourselves to uh, underfund defense, underdevelop our capabilities, uh, misunderstand emerging technologies, then I do think you could get to a very, very dangerous period when you could, in fact, drift into a general uh, collision uh, on the scale of World War One or World War Two in a way that would be truly horrifying. Yeah. In, in, do you think given what we're seeing on well, missile defense and uh, on our nuclear deterrent, uh, the modernization and maintenance thereof, uh, on intelligence, the fight that I mentioned a moment ago that's taking place in the Congress now between your one of your successors, uh, Nancy Pelosi, that we are, in fact, at risk of such a uh, very, very dangerous uh, pass. I think we're drifting towards a much more dangerous world. I think that it is... Uh, every evidence we have is that we are, and, and, the, and the current budget proposals um, correctly focus on Iraq and Afghanistan, but then they incorrectly neglect uh, the development of capabilities to cope with China and others 10, 15, 20 years out. And if you don't start the investment right now, you won't have the capability 10 or 15 years from now. And so I think we've gotten trapped into a budget-driven military and national security weakness. And, of course, the damage that uh, Speaker Pelosi has done to the intelligence community is truly stunning and I think something that's enormously dangerous. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much for being with us uh, for what I hope will be the first of many appearances on Secure Freedom Radio. That was Newt Gingrich. Stay tuned. We'll be back right after this with more of Secure Freedom Live from Washington. You're listening to the voice of freedom, the voice of liberty, the voice of the nation. This is Radio America.